to Modeling the Ocean, the Conservation and Science of Marine Aquariums, featuring Mr. Andrew Sandler. My name's, <laughs> there you go. I told you, friendly crowd, friendly crowd. <laughs> uh, my name's Valerie Forbes, and I'm the Dean of the College of Science here at FAU. Um, we're really happy to have you all join us this evening for what promises to be an exciting and informative discussion. Mr. Sandler, founder and CEO of Polar Reef, has taken coral reef enthusiasm to a whole new level. His lecture will take you on a journey through some of the most visionary, complex, and expansive privately operated marine aquaria. For the past few months, we have been working closely with Andrew, and I am truly amazed by what he and his team have accomplished. Andrew and his team at Polar Reef in New York are recreating the ocean to provide the natural conditions found throughout the world's tropics. The diverse exotic coral and unique reef fish found in the aquaria at Polar Reef, including the 17,000 gallon tank in Andrew's home. And in case you can't really grasp what 17,000 gallons are, let's just say you can scuba dive in it. That gives you an idea are key to the organization's efforts in supporting species preservation and restoration. Mr. Sandler and his team are renowned for their work in the aquarium and reef keeping community. From skillfully quarantining and treating new fish before they're introduced into the closed marine environment to developing novel medical treatments for corals. Educating the public about the ocean and aquariums, pioneering technologies for reef keeping and conservation, and supporting research and educational charities are at the core of Polar Reef's mission. Outside of several local businesses, Andrew serves on the board of various charities in order to give back to the hobby. He maintains an extremely busy schedule between his business and family, yet his passion for the reef keeping hobby is unmatched. And we can't wait to hear all about it. Tonight, I'm delighted to announce that Mr. Sandler has created a science internship opportunity for our students, so listen up students, to learn alongside him and his team at Polar Reef. And we're thankful that our students can now gain hands-on experience in this highly unique environment. This internship embodies the experiential and impactful learning opportunities that we strive to provide to students in the college. The Schmidt College of Science has a footprint across four major campuses in South Florida, stretching along 120 miles of the Atlantic coastline and serving well over 8,000 students. And the college can offer such unique opportunities to our students in part because of our world-class faculty. The university is ranked as a high research activity institution by the Carnegie Foundation. Florida Atlantic actively promotes undergraduate research and the College of Science is leading the way at the university with the most undergraduate students involved in authentic research of any college at FAU. Science majors have the chance to gain real world experience in the lab or out in the field, working alongside faculty who are solving some of the world's most complex and society, societally relevant problems, especially when it comes to the environment. And this is at least partly due to our strategic location. We're in the most populated metropolitan area in the state, which also includes low-lying urban landscapes, the Everglades, and the Atlantic Ocean. This ideally positions us to use the powerful tools of science to address the challenges we face due to sea level rise, deteriorating, deteriorating water quality, and climate change impacts on our ecosystems, just to name a few. Before we get to the main event, I have a couple of housekeeping items. At the end of the lecture, there'll be a short Q&A, so I ask you to please hold your questions. Until then, I'll come around with the microphone and you can ask all the questions you want. Uh, and then we'll have a reception, um, which I'm sure Andrew and his team will be uh, happy to answer any more questions that you might have. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our featured speaker, Mr. Andrew Sandler. Thank you, Dean. Appreciate that. And uh, thank you guys for all your support. I'm going to the remote mic. Hold on. 
You hear him? Good, right? Okay. Thank you all for being here. I really appreciate it. Uh, the support's been unbelievable. And my first thank you and gratitude to the FAU people that really worked hard on this, including Kelly, Zach, um, and Yvonne. Really appreciate all your help, all those late nights. <laughs> and I'm particularly proud um, on a personal level to be here working with a sister who introduced me, thank you, Robs, and in the name of my, uh, my late father, who gave to this school and would love what I'm doing right now. So with that, <laughs> let me, uh, let's get to this. I'm just gonna walk around and start. Okay, I get this question a lot. What is Polo Reef? And where did the name come from? And just wasn't too scientific. I actually live on Polo Drive, across from the Polo Fields. And so this was pretty easy. We actually had a company called Polo Reef. It was an LLC. And we set it up uh, for uh, originally just to separate the fish business from all my other stuff, not knowing anything where this was going. And where it started was in COVID, when people were quarantining. Um, somehow I got my camera out and took a lot of lousy videos of the tank that I thought was good looking, but it really wasn't. And I'm actually, um, I learned a lot about camera skills over the last two years, uh, having failed photography in home ec a few times. Uh, so Polar Reef has become my, my organization to give back to the hobby, whether it be philanthropy, whether it be um, education. Uh, it, this hobby has done so well for me. Uh, really, I think it just keeps your mind so occupied. It's such a challenge that I want to give back and create that spark in young kids myself. So there is a video here that actually does a better job than I can explain it. And this video was taken two years ago. So I was 54, I'm now 56 in this video. <laughs> but this sort of explains it better than I can. I am, uh, I guess, considered a passionate, extreme hobbyist of all sorts. This is my glorious hobby where I can relax and escape the hustle and bustle of Wall Street. Uh, when things aren't going so smoothly in the market, I look up and it gives me a sense of how small we are in the universe. Two thirds of our planet in blue. Certainly that there's life beyond stock prices. <laughs> I think what this is, is living art. I think you are reproducing a snapshot of nature and doing that in an extreme fashion. There's a whole nother side that, you know, is investment and about, about uh, owning houses or traveling. And, and so that's not my thing. My thing is this. I guess I have a, uh, a little impulsive perfectionist personality where, you know, 10 gallons became 20 gallons and 20 became 40, 40s became a couple of hundreds and fresh became salt. And here we are, I'm 54 years old and, and, and this is what's the creation of all that. 17,000 gallons. The, the original vision for this tank was pretty close to this. Um, we knew we wanted something a wall of water of somehow. The, the idea was to do something wonderful and build a bulletproof system that it would run, run itself um, as ma maintenance free as possible, if, if there is such a thing. And uh, this system took uh, 
nearly six years from from planning engineering stage until fish first fish hit. Six years, very painful, very frustrating period of time. The grand design was um, to to display some of the most unusual, rarest, and most beautiful fish from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, those those fish basically range in biotope type from uh, basically Hawaii through Indo-Pacific and the Red Sea. Anytime a stunning new rare, just because I know when I get the fish, they're basically coming to Disney World, okay? I'm gonna take care of them, and they probably have a higher lifespan in my tanks than in nature. Me building this tank, I can inspire this hobby to take it to the next level and raise the bar, and therefore save more fish in the future. Uh, over the years, I've become significantly uh, philanthropic, and, and now I'm, I'm on a mission to give back, to give back to the hobby, to give back any way I can. And, and now um, is my time to give back to the hobby, whether this is to grow the hobby and a learning experience, or raising the bar, or inspiring people. That's what I want to do. At the very least, Put a smile on their face. I want people to 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 uh, to smile, to be to be happy, to to bring joy, to peace, um, and help them follow their dreams. If their dreams is owning a fishbowl, I'm happy for them. If they want a massive scale tank, that's fine. If if they get into cars and become an expert, and that's great too. I could have easily have invested the money more wisely than this. I could have probably had beach houses and other things staring at the ocean instead of this. But um, following the passion and living life like that and, and inspiring, yeah, that's a whole different story. So I, I um I don't want you to think that I can do this myself, that we have a team of us, uh, and this team is expanding all the time. We have uh, guys that do coral care, guys that run operations, guys that do equipment in general, and now I have a web developer, and so this thing is growing. Uh, this is a video that we thought we should play because it does a better job than I can to set the stage for this next 55 minute talk. Coral reefs. Their bright, vivid colors can be seen in tropical ocean waters around the globe. Beyond their brilliant appearance lies a hidden significance. Coral are animals. Though they may look like colorful plants, Coral are in fact made up of tiny animals called polyps. These invertebrates can range from the size of a pinhead to a bit larger than a basketball. Each polyp consists of a soft sac-like body topped by a mouth covered in stinging tentacles. To protect their soft bodies and add support, the polyps secrete limestone skeletons or calicles. Corals are mega builders. Polyp calicles connect to one another, creating a colony that acts as a single organism. As colonies grow over hundreds and thousands of years, they join with other colonies and become reefs that can grow to hundreds of miles long. The largest coral reef is Australia's Great Barrier Reef, which began growing about 20... So, um, we're going to get a little bit to the meat and potatoes here, which is you have this natural ocean, and Mother Nature has mastered this thing. Actually, not quite true. There's plenty of devastation. Um, how do we make this into this successfully.
And this is an extreme example of a 15 gallon nanotank. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about how the hobby is working with the scientists on this reef restoration projects. So I'm gonna get into some water chemistry. And uh, for all you guys, this is, this is a little bit of a tough crowd um, because probably half of you have no idea how to run a saltwater tank. Half of you are probably master reefers. And then a part of you are, are scientists that do this for a living. So I, I may need to back up a little bit a few times, but um, I'm gonna do my best. So salt and pure water. These are commercially available salts that imitate reef water once they're mixed with RODI water, which is, just think about it, like evaporated water. It's pure water. We make that in the house. And you can get, uh, when mixed properly, you can get very close to natural seawater. And so this is um, one of the great science, um, you know, technologies of the industry, how, how basically how great these salts are now. And uh, in my opinion, um, all of them work. They have some small, different characteristics, but at the end of the day, at least to start, this is, a, this is your hobby best friend. And here's a, another slide that shows our water sample, which uh, we send to the lab. This is a mass spec machine. Uh, you guys know mass spec. That's uh, Abby at NCIS. You guys know that one? She spends a lot of time on mass spec. They, they'll go down to the individual element here, uh, bromine, chloride, fluoride, down to one part per billion. And I can see with some green arrows, red arrows, where, where I'm high and low, et cetera, et cetera. But we can get really close. Now the question really is, now that you get close, that's about as close as you're gonna get without problems for a while. And uh, hobbyists tear their, their, their hair out, be trying to maintain this for the first time, and we're gonna tell you how to do it. But before I do it, I need to back up and give you guys a little definition of alkalinity. Uh, the definition of alkalinity um, is basically the pH buffering capability of your, of your tank. Think of it as uh, your sodium bicarbonate, your sodium, uh, your baking soda in the refrigerator. Think about that particular product, the amount of that in seawater, and that is what we call alkalinity. And the problem with this alkalinity is when a coral sucks it up and consumes it to grow their skeleton, they rapidly deplete this very quickly. In fact, the point I'd like to make here is natural seawater has a calcium level of about 420 parts per million uh, and an alkalinity of seven to eight. Each unit that gets absorbed by the coral is about 20 ppms of calcium or only 5% of the available calcium is absorbed. But a full, almost three dKH is basically consumed, which is about 40% of natural seawater. Hence, the coral will essentially absorb itself to death. Next page. So unless you provide this alkalinity and carbon buffer to the coral, the coral will not survive. Now, this particular slide we talk a little bit about other things like magnesium, calcium carbonates, calciums, but at the end of the day, this parameter, alkalinity, is the biggest single, if I had to pick one, I would say the biggest single boogeyman that kills reef tanks, the people that have this sway. And I mean, if this thing goes up or down more than one dKH in a 24 hour period, you will see effects on the coral. So how do we, 
How do we know what the consumption of the coral is? How do we know how much we need to add of this alkalinity and calcium? And the only way of doing it is to test. And the, the reason why we have to test is because all the corals that come in, some of them are injured, some of them are healthy, some of them want to want to consume, some don't. You don't know how many sticks you have in your tank relative to the amount of water. And so at the end of the day, this is a completely variable situation and testing is the only way to get through it. These are the ones where uh, people that aren't colorblind can use. <laughs> And, and these ones over here now tell you the color and then read it digitally. It even has even gotten even crazier in automation. We can now set up test kits that test for you automatically with an app on your phone, constantly reading alk, calcium, salinity, magnesium, etc. So we're going to walk through some methods here of, of maintaining alkalinity first. And the first one is called the calcium reactor. And this is basically a fancy word. I'm going to stand up here. This is a fancy word for a big tube. This is Polar Reef's calcium reactor, by the way. This is five feet uh, by, I think it's about almost four or five feet diameter. I'll go back. Calcium reactor works the exact opposite way of calcification. Inside a calcium reactor lives what we call aragonite, which is a fancy word for crushed coral skeleton. Now, now what happens when you blow CO2 and lower the pH inside this chamber, the coral skeletons melt and it releases the alkalinity and calcium in the exact ratio that it was absorbed in, the correct one, back into the tank. And uh, we control the pH we want. So if you really want a really rocking calcium reactor, you know, set the pH down to 6.2 and let that thing really melt away. And we also can control the drip and the drip rate going through it into the tank. Here's another method. Caulkwasser, also known as calcium hydroxide. Uh, some of you may know pickling lime in the supermarket. This is a uh, balanced calcium additive. We add it to our evaporated water that we lose during the day. This is our barrel. Uh, the tank loses about 50 gallons a day, so that's about 50 gallons. We add calcium hydroxide to this, and this machine right here, uh, delivers it and doses it throughout the day very slowly. And the key from slowly is it's very, very high pH and caustic. So if you put this stuff in your tank too quickly, you're going to get a pH spike and have all sorts of damage. Here's another way. Two-part. Two-part is basically, let's add some alkalinity chemicals, soda ash, baking soda, put it in some water, dilute it, put it in our tank, and then we take calcium chloride and make a solution, and we add that to the tank, and we do it in separate locations, and we do it at separate times so the two don't mix, and voila, if you, tons of commercially available products that can do this, and uh, we do them on dosers, we do them manually. Uh, the key here is, is if you put them together, they form a, uh, calcium carbonate, and they completely react. So it has to be made in two parts. So another big problem, and I'm going to switch away from alkalinity. I'm going to go to nutrients. And uh, nutrients is what you get when you add fish, you add fish food, you add poop, you feed the fish, you feed the coral, and you're going to get stuff Nitrogen and, phosph and phosphorus. That's what you're going to get. And they are fertilizers. And with that, they can smother the reef in algae. And unless we do something about these nutrients, they're a problem for the reef. They will smother the coral. Um, Rashid, don't hit play yet. 
This is a, a video that I did. Uh, it's, a, it's a spoof on 2010 Space Odyssey. And uh, we took out the monkey part and the monoliths. But, but you'll see, and, and the focus on the brown algae uglies, because that's another process where the Aquarius go through because the tank is not ready yet and it still has a bacterial imbalance. Good. There, guys. The tank is not ready for coral yet. Now it is. Any of that. If I'm not scaring you yet, we got more to go. Um, how do we get rid of this algae? How do we clean up? Um, I broke it out into some natural stuff first, then into more complicated stuff. So the first thing is our, our cleanup crew, as the hobbyists call it, those are your hermit crabs and your urchins and your cucumbers and all sorts of um, yeah, all sorts of snails that will eat the algae off your rocks. Um, at Polo Reef, the way we do it more so is with urchins. And so here is a video of us quarantining about 300 urchins in the quarantine. Um, Another way of doing it is a natural way is you grow your own algae ball or, well, go back. You grow your own algae somewhere remote in a tank. It's called the refugium. And that's sucking up the nutrients and growing. And then you have to harvest it and literally pull it apart and throw, and throw out a piece and let it grow again. Same thing, this is a uh, internal algae scrubber, the same concept. They have screens. You grow an algae on these things, and someone's got to go in there and harvest it. And in theory, as this grows, you reduce nitrates and phosphates. So this is a video we put together of another method that we use called protein skimming, but we wanted to show you what it looked like in nature at the beach. Some of you know what this is, and you've seen this. So uh, what that is is basically organic material. And the nice thing about salt water is when organic material and salt water go together, we can create bubbles that create a foam. And that foam is collected and discarded because that stuff is nasty. Um, here are our protein skimmers at uh, Apollo Reef. Hey guys, and all you foam junkies out there, look at all this foam. This Cleaned about an hour ago. Pretty killer. MRC. Very happy. Thank you, Tim and Raj. Nutrients are down. So, so the object here is to get to get this stuff yep. out of your tank before it breaks down into into nutrients. Uh, you'll see the basic design here. Uh, this is a hobbyist. This is the hobbyist protein skimmer in size, just to show you the scale of ours relative to the average protein skimmer. And they just, we blow air into it or we take a engine that chops the bu into small micro bubbles. The, mu the bubbles literally uh, form a foam and the foam is collected. Uh, now we run some ozone in the tank uh, for you, all you guys that 
all you older people that have ozone therapy for your back. How, who does that? <laughs> Any event. Um, it's radioactive oxygen. It's O3. And the extra oxygen molecule basically binds with organics. And this really helps quite a bit keep the water clean and clear. Uh, not, a, not an easy thing to vent or work with in a house. It's got to be properly planned. Another way, we chemically absorb the nutrients. And this is no different than activated carbon in your house that you use uh, to filter out that delicious Florida water. <laughs> uh, in this, these, these two chambers, we're running uh, activated carbon and, and GFO. GFO, granule ferric oxide, right here. It basically just, it absorbs phosphate. It works so well that uh, we have to be careful not to absorb too much uh, when we change it because that can even be uh, more stressful on the corals. And, and here's another uh, method. Uh, this is actually polar reef method. We're using what's called the sulfur reactor. This is uh, a piece of equipment that, um, let's see if I can, this is, the, it's basically two chambers. First chamber is filled with sulfur material. It's yellow, rotten egg, yes, rotten egg smell. The water flows through the sulfur very, very slowly. We keep it at an ORP of, uh, you know, for all you scientists, we keep it around negative 200, negative 300. Uh, the next chamber it flows into is the aragonite chamber to rebuff the pH because this water coming out of here, even though there might be 10 nitrates going in, there's zero going out and uh, sulfuric acid is built up and that needs to be re rebuffed up. And so the pH going back into the tank is closer to the tank water. So that's how that works. And then another method that we use is basic water ch changes. Remember I told you salt was everybody's best friend. Uh, this is the way we make our salt and our water changes and our vat. Our vat holds about 5,000 gallons of water. Um, this is Yeltsin. Uh, you're gonna see a video Yeltsin. making salt. This is my automation. <laughs> Looks like he's four sodium sodium chloride food grade for one thousand gallons. Then we use mag sulfate, and then we four the liquids these, are delivered to me by one ESV. One magnesium and three liquids. And the real science is in the liquids. Um, in fact, uh, ESV and I are working together on on numerous projects, numerous salts, custom salts custom solutions, and so forth. So now I want to get into a little bit about uh, um, get away from nutrients and get into trace elements. And trace element to me is anything like under five parts per million and into the parts per billion. And there are three methods here, uh, three really schools of thought, and I'm going to go through with you. First one is old school. Get the alc alc calcium, magnesium right. Nothing else matters. Those are the big three. Do your water changes, um, and those wa water changes will replenish whatever is missing. Still a lot of old school reefers that do this and are successful. Second myth is... Uh, Look, this technology, let's get do an ICP test, let's send it out. Maybe I'll put some trace elements in if, there's, if it's zeroing out. Uh, sometimes they use broad trace elements like Seachem Reef Trace that has a lot of things in them. Um, it's a good middle ground. And then there's guys like me, which are the control freaks that need to dose every element. And this is a video right here, and you'll see boron, selenium, molybdenum. What does that say, boron there? Uh, I can't even read all these. That's barium, cobalt. You can see in a uh, 
17,000 gallon tank. This is my daily, my daily additives. And you can see how 13 mils, seven mils, dosing that daily into a 17,000 gallon system and then sending the lab test out to the lab and get the results to see whether or not your trace elements are high and low. And that's the way we do it because we have no idea unless we test and send out. And we send our samples out at least every two weeks. Um, this is my current parameters. A lot of people like to see this. Uh, it just tells you the ranges of things. We keep our alkalinity around eight and a half, uh, phosphate are around 0.1, our nitrates around 10. Um, interesting enough, if you tested nitrate and phosphate in the ocean, it would be zeroed, zero. It's one of the things the hobby has learned that if we run a slightly elevated nutrient tank, um, the corals actually do better. The corals do better. And that's because in our glass boxes, we don't have access to the food source in the ocean of plankton. Okay, moving on to fish care. All these fish have gone through my quarantine system. Uh, some beautiful eye candy. I have a, a story about every one of them, but this particular one is the only one of its kind. Um, it's a test tube baby of some sort that uh, two angels were in, in, in a breeding facility that would never meet in the wild and this one baby popped out. And uh, they've been unable to duplicate it since. So it is the rarest fish in the world. It's the only one of its kind. Uh, along with some, some of the other ones here, very, very, very rare. In our opinion, the beginning of fish care must start right here in the quarantine. And whether you have 2,500 gallons of water uh, with five systems like we do, or you have a 20-gallon tank set up for a quarantine, if you don't do this, you are asking for big, big problems. Yeah, you see the next slide. And identify some of these problems here with just two diseases. There are lots. Uh, both of these diseases are more or less 30-day uh, cycles where the eggs get released and then free swimmers come and get the fish and they keep getting and multiplying. And in the case of this beauty, this, well, let me go back. This disease right here, this odinium, velvet, this is deadly in your tank. You get this in your display tank, you're talking 48 hours, you probably have to say goodbye to your fish, every one of them. Everyone. I, I've seen this, this disease take out more hobbyists than I would like. And so this cannot get into our display tank. And the reason why is because the medications that solve that problem kill your coral. So you got to medicate it and eradicate it externally away from the tank. So in Polar Reef, we basically proactively medicate all the fish that go through the system. And we treat for formalin baths, for flukes and external stuff. We do praziquantel for worming and, uh, and flukes. We medicate our food. Some of you know metrodonazole probably. Uh, we use chloroquine phosphate, believe it or not, we do. Uh, that was tough to get in COVID. Uh, we use copper, um, and we use antibiotics, and, and depending on, on what, the, uh, what the need is. And frankly, uh, when, I, when I don't know the answer, I call one of the great fish vets, and one of them is right here. Where are you, Charlie? Doctor. Right there. <laughs> this guy's a genius and, and, uh, as a fish vet and has helped me through a lot of, a lot of issues. Here is some of our eye candy that's gone through quarantine. <laughs> These antheas are uh, no easy task to get through with meds, by the way. These, these guys, I mean, you, you gotta like buy 50 of them to get 10 at the end sometimes. 
All right, so what happens if you do everything correctly and there's never a problem? The chances are there's always a problem. <laughs> and so what happens if something gets through the quarantine process and it has a polar reef? And I'll tell you what we do. Uh, let's go back for a sheet for a second. Uh, we medicate the food that we feed the fish. We soak it in sulfur, metro, antibiotics. Does it help? Sometimes. Uh, we can throw hydrogen peroxide in the water. Now, a lot of Aquarius use the 3% stuff because my tank is so big, I use the 32% stuff, which is pretty crazy. And um, the corals don't like it, and I'd rather not use it. We, had to use, we have had to use it once. You can try to catch the fish if it's not spread all over and treat the fish in quarantine. We got a video for that. And most importantly, we have found, at least with our UV bulbs, UV, ultraviolet, uh, it kills free swimming parasites. Ultraviolet, uh, you'll see our, our particular setup. It really makes a big difference when we change our bulbs. So we're changing our bulbs now between every six to nine months, even though they're spec for 15 months. Here's a video. Uh, we did a little show this, this, uh, this fall, and this was part of the show. It's a YouTube show called Di Diary of a Mad Reefer. This is one of the episodes we were trying to go after one of the fish. A drug we don't want to. So two hours into this, I finally caught one of the heniocas in the net. I'm sure it's happened to all of us, whether it's in a 17,000 gallon tank or a 20 gallon tank. I caught it. Of course, I almost slipped because the power heads and the flow is so intense in there and a slight little opening, he got right out. So I went to go get Rashid some food to trap the fish. And all of a sudden I heard screaming and yelling and apparently he caught the heniocus. Good, 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 good. It's huge, it's huge. So I'm walking to the quarantine tank to put the heniocus in, and I hear more screaming. Apparently, he got another one. Those heniocus butterflies are huge. As I was putting one in, I got splashed in the face, and then the two were fighting with each other, and I had to move one alone. Tear down to zero. Okay. This is my, uh, my pharmacy. In, in, in so we got I like to be a pharmacist. At least one, it could be a fish two pharmacist. Two heniocuses and a gold flake with a skin condition. Uh, the treatment will be rather simple. Praziquantel for the uh, flukes, a formalin bath, and or a freshwater dip, depending on what comes off the eye. And the antibiotics, by the way. Drug. Um, this is our UV sterilizer. Uh, this is... You can ride this thing like a, like a horse. It's, it's uh, 10 feet long, it's uh, this wide. Uh, it's got 10 bulbs, it's got 4,000 watts and 300,000 microjoules, and that is enough to kill free swimming parasites. Most hobby-grade equipment will not, and just give you some time, maybe uh, a little bit of uh, some medication with, with that, it helps, but mine really is a big deal. We run uh, about 700 gallons a minute through this thing also, so basically uh, a majority of the water is going through this on the first pass. Okay, so before we show this slide, we added this slide last minute because we wanted to talk a little bit about fish nutrition, and we didn't really speak about it. And my point with fish nutrition is we get all different types of food, fresh. Uh, we go to the seafood market, clams, shrimps, and so forth. Um, but the vegetarians the, the, out there, they need their veggies, and we feed them seaweed. And we feed them on uh, very low-tech poles and strings and PVC. And, and here's a video we did of some fish eating some veggies.
the other one come down soon. We feed, I would say, 30 to 60 sheets of seaweed twice a day. Okay, fish part is now over, and we're going to go to coral. And these are some of the beauties that we have quarantined. The coral needs the same quarantine, maybe even more. I mean, I don't know about maybe more, but coral, wait, wait till you see the, some of the stuff that, that we find on our coral that comes off. This is our lab. Uh, this is a part of the lab, but this is the, um, our inspection where we have special lights and microscopes and tools to remove what I'm about to show you, what we find. If any of these get into your tank, there is a good chance your coral will be eaten alive. These are, wait, let me get my, these things coming off right here, those little dots, those are all flatworms coming off of a Ganapura coral. This one right here, you'll see a flatworm this is an expensive torch also. You'll see a flatworm right there. And what's really even worse than the flatworm, which you're about to see, are the eggs. And you see them? There they are. Anyway, the eggs are really hard to see. And Chemicals and medications do not kill the eggs. So the eggs must be removed manually or they have to be continued to be treated as the eggs hatch to adults, which is why we keep coral in quarantine and keep dipping and medicating and dipping and medicating because it's a numbers game and something's going to get through. This last one is a nudie branch. Came out of a zoa, right? Came out of a zoo. These guys like camouflage just themselves, so you can't even see them. Um, you, you really got to have a tremendous eyes. And we gave you some some pictures of what a healthy coral would look like right here. This is a healthy monty. And these nudie branches, you can actually see them here in the picture. That's never this clear. Do you see the little white things here? The little stars. Those are your your pests, and they are eating away this coral, and this coral will not have any red on it very shortly. Same thing here. This is a beautiful, healthy acro coral, and this one is eaten away by the flatworms. You can actually see the bite marks. Um, so let me just give you, before I get into the, what we do about it, we actually even have to we get crabs on corals, and we actually have to know what crabs are good crabs and good bad crabs. So uh, that's an interesting sport. Um, but we treat our coral with uh, iodine-based dips, potassium chloride, bayer, like the weed killer bayer, hydrogen peroxide, and then we use Cipro, amoxy, erythromycin, amino acids to heal the coral back up. Again, the eggs are the real problem. Now I'm going to take you to, you have this pest-free coral and pest-free tank, and you, we still have to get these corals in good shape, and nutrition is a big deal. And here's a... Uh, He's a, he has living proof that they don't live just on photosynthesis. Watch him suck this food in. Years ago, we used to light our tanks up very brightly, and we didn't feed our corals, and the corals didn't do well. Today, we understand that uh, they need to be fed. And we feed with what everyone else feeds with, basically freeze-dried zooplankton, freeze-dried cope pods, etc., etc., mycy shrimp. And we also direct 
broadcast feed. You certainly cannot feed individual corals in a 17,000 gallon tank. That, that's not happening. So we, uh, we broadcast feed our stuff, which means dump it in and let the filters blow it around. Uh, we go into the tank and we look for pests. The divers are basically turning corals upside down, looking for eggs. We actually will go in, and you'll see a video of us blowing off coral with RODI water to dislodge them so that the fish can eat the worms. Right here, this is Michelle, who goes in the tank and dives, and she is uh, putting in 50 gallons of RO water, blowing the corals, and the wrasses will just stay there waiting for the pest to get dislodged. The, the RO water really, um, they don't, like, they don't like the fresh water at all. The next part of coral care is what we call fragging. Fragging is a, uh, a common term in the hobby. This is the way we make genetic babies. We can actually cut a piece of coral and make an identical piece of coral. Now, I stole this video from my buddy, Reiki, uh, who I hope doesn't mind. Go ahead. Off. If they bring too much drama into your life, cut them off. If they're constantly negative, cut them off. If they bring too much drama into your life, cut them off. And when you cut them off and you plant them on one of these discs with glue and epoxy, go ahead. In a few weeks, months, year, you have an identical mother colony potentially growing. And we use this method uh, a lot. We prune the reef just the way you guys prune your plants. Corals grow on each other. They have warfare. You got to eliminate that. We like to give our corals and put a piece or two in a different tank just in case something happens to the one tank. We have a gene bank, essentially. And so we make these frags. And most of the corals that are bought in this hobby are bought usually that small, like a frag. Okay, lighting. How are we doing on time, Rashid? Let's do this. Go ahead, look. So, the important thing here that, that I wanted to highlight is coral are exactly the opposite of plants. Plants absorb white, green, orange, red light from the sun. Um, corals their algae inside of them actually absorb much better. 90% of the light is in the violet and blue, right here. And then as you go down in depth, you lose all that color anyway, and you get left with the blues and violets. So as a long-term adaptation, uh, corals basically do better with blue light, blue and violets. Now, this is why... Um, the aquarium industry is, you know, they come out with new bulbs, all sorts of new technologies, and, and uh, this is the way we do it. We measure our, go back, Rashid, forward. This is what's called a, a PAR meter. This is a light sensor meter that measures the intensity of the light, and we go down on the water. So this is an extra big cord, and we measure our light. Uh, and we can actually set the computers to mirror. This is the actual light in a reef in Hawaii, underwater, and then we can mirror the app to that exact photo period, and then we know roughly the light intensity to use, no more than four or 500 par, probably 100 to 150, and if you can average, next page, if you can average around two, 300 with a nice blue hue, uh, again, we, we run, 85% blue, 15% white. Other people will run 50-50 and, and run it successfully. Corals are very adaptable. The key is not to change and tinker once you have it set. And this is our lighting schedule at Polar Reef. Uh, 8 a.m. to 10 a.m., the blue. 30-minute ramp. 10 to 12, some whites come on. Three to five, the whites go off. So I only have a few hours of, of white in here. 
Uh, and five to eight is 100% blue. And really, uh, we have enough par in our tank to run the whole tank blue. We never even turning up the whites. The whites are for, your, for the eyes. Maybe a little bit of color. Uh, you'll, you'll see here, this is a chart. We go in and do dives, and we write the par numbers that we get in each location. And we need to know that because there are certain corals that do better under higher par and certain with lower par. And we need to know where to place the corals. So this is a, a trend, I call it trend in lighting, technology stuff. Uh, years ago, we started with fluorescent lights, Sylvania bulbs, you know them. We moved to these crazy metal halide bulbs that had, have massive heat but massive broadbands, uh, broad based spectrum. We've gone to T5s, which are smaller fluorescents, and now to LEDs. And uh, most of the hobby are running LEDs right now. And the real reason is they're very controllable. I can control each channel exactly. I can control my blues, my violets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's limited heat. This stuff used to cook your tanks, and people would have to run chillers, and that would cause more heat. Um, so I have the following trends. Conservation, away from heat, power, and wattage. And there's been a trend towards keeping corals for color, pop, uh, iridescence. And so there's been a trend in blue relative to white. Blue probably colors the corals up in general better. All right, I'm going to switch to the circulatory system, which is the water flow. Um, this nice little video here. Shows you, it shows you how violent the flows are in the natural ocean and what we have to duplicate. So... Providing proper flow is really important. Just, just think about this for three, three simple things. It increases the oxygen in the tank. It brings food to the coral. And it flushes the coral waste away from photosynthesis. And you need the right flow. And look what technology has actually done for us. Uh, this is the old school way of doing it with power heads. And what we were doing was... Uh, blowing this directional stuff one direction and ripping tissue off corals. And now we have these new pumps that uh, the engine is outside, so we got heat savings, and it's actually pushing and pulling and creating all sorts of currents and reef crests and waves. And this is, uh, uh, tr tremendously has helped the hobby. Um, now, in a 17,000 gallon tank. You can't use a little thing like that. So this is what we use. Let's go back there. This is what we use, uh, along with our pumps. This is called a Hydro Wizard. It actually pumps, uh, I think, up to 50 or 60,000 gallons per hour. And we're running it roughly at 50 or 60% of capacity. And when I add that to all the other pumps and surge systems in the Polar Reef, uh, we think Polar Reef is, uh, have about 60,000 gallons of flow going through this, the system at all times. And the worst part of this is flow is one of those things that, that um, you can never, you need to future proof because as corals get bigger and older, you're going to need more of it and they shade each other, and we need more. And so we're looking at solutions now, um, things that actually come down from, from the ceiling and retract back up to do sweeps and so forth. All right, this starts the coral conservation and restoration part of the presentation. And uh, with this alarming video, Water. 
We're made mostly of water, around 70%. And what a bizarre coincidence, or no coincidence at all, is that our planet's surface is covered by water at that same percentage. That's how important water is to us. So as we work hard to protect the air and the land, it's just as crucial, if not more, that we protect the sea. Here in Australia, there is a system of 3,000 individual coral reefs spanning 1,400 miles. They are living structures that provide a habitat to an ecosystem so vast they're considered the tropical rainforests of the sea. But after a long, healthy life around 25 million years, the coral reef in this area is dying. About half of it since 1995. Gone. Dead. And soon with it, all of those organisms that depend on them. Including us. We're all running out of time. Okay. So, um, the next slide, was she? What's causing this coral problem and with reefs? And, and it's all this stuff here, and you read about, uh, from warming waters to pollution to the fishing. There have been a lot of storms lately, and, and uh, uh, that, that really wrecks a reef. Ocean acidification from carbon dioxide and a little lower pH in the, in the, in the ocean runoffs from construction, plastics, and ultimately, um, it's probably not one of these things, it's several of these things, and they're basically, uh, if they get hit one after another, it really becomes a problem. So what happens when the reefs become in trouble? Uh, the, the hobbyists have been dealing with coral bands and fish bands for several, actually for, for decades. Uh, this is a history of, of reefs closing and uh, hobbyists not being able to get stuff. But I want to focus on this last one. And this last one is a doozy. All Hawaii ornamental fish were banned in January 2021. And believe it or not, there are very specific species of fish that come only from Hawaii endemic. And this little guy right here, this yellow tang, which at one point was probably the most common saltwater fish in the hobby, uh, cost you 60 bucks, nah, 40 if you got a peco, <laughs> 60 if you got the regular local fish store. Uh, the price went up to $650, $600. Can't get them. Done, over, along with a whole bunch of other Hawaiian fish. Um, and so the point is the hobby hates this too. The hobby needs the, concert, the reefs healthy, and I think we need each other. So here are some methods that they use to rebuild the reef. Uh, I'm not going to go through every one of these things. Uh, you already talked about the fragmentation. That's literally taking little pieces out and replanting them. Um, this, uh, this artificial reef is on this tree. They, they basically create structure, and then they'll collect pieces and uh, tie them on. They'll tie them on to ropes. They'll coral garden, which basically means in a nursery. You grow them in, in, indoors. And that's where the hobby has really helped. And um, go back, go back for a second, Rashid. This is the one that I want to spend most of the timing on right today is coral spawning, because it has such huge upside potential, but it's so hard to scale. And what it offers is the potential to create, and we now can do this. We can now collect sperm and egg from corals, freeze them, hold them, bank them. Uh, we're actually working on making super corals that are adaptable to the lower pHs or bacterial infections. Um, the problem with this is you, 
takes two years probably before you get a coral baby dot to a piece this big. And then you probably need another year or two in a nursery. So it's very hard to scale to go back into the ocean. Here is a uh, set of coral spawning stations. We're friendly with these guys. They make these things they, in a box. Countries are, are, are buying these. Um, eat, uh, all over the world, Saudi Arabia, etc., etc. The eggs settle, um, and uh, you, in theory, you don't need to take another coral from the reef again. In theory, and that's what this offers: the, the potential for creating coral without taking from the reef. Now these guys are here, and I promised I'm going to spend some time on this. I'm going to bring you back a little bit locally to the local Florida news. Um, the first thing I want to tell you about is the Florida reefs are really in trouble. Way bigger trouble than all that stuff you saw at the Great Barrier Reef. So apparently there's only 2% of the reef left in, in Florida. And what made it worse was this new disease that went through waterborne disease, probably bacterial. You can't dump antibiotics in the ocean. That doesn't work. Um, it killed all these stony corals, and uh, people are getting involved. And this particular institute, the Reef Institute here down in West Palm Beach, we were down visiting on Friday. And they are, are a full-service situation where they go and rescue corals that were going to die from this disease. And there are several in the shop. They educate young kids. They grow the coral and spawn the coral. And then they literally replant it when it's ready. And I believe tomorrow something's going on, right? First time going back to West Palm Beach, right? Boynton. Replanting in Boynton tomorrow. Pretty cool. Um, how are they going to do? That's great. The, these guys are the real heroes right here of, that's saving the planet. Yeah, these brains right here, right? Yeah, yep. So, um, why is this all so important? Well, apparently I've been told that um, a lot of these nurseries and spawning stations, there a lot of the scientists are really good ab on the field in the ocean, but they have no idea how to grow coral in a box. No, zero. And so we bring in Aquarius that know something about that, and we have new partnership, and that's is the most exciting thing that I think is happening. Now, I have a nice handshake here between the hobbyist and the scientist and things that we're doing together, uh, like uh, coral aquaculture. We now think that we're getting close to 50% of all coral in the trade. When I buy a coral or when someone buys a coral, it has never seen the ocean. It's been aquacultured and grown, and that's a great thing because these corals are actually better adapted for aquarium life. Uh, you buy a wild coral, it comes with pests. Uh, it's, you take a much bigger risk, and God, can you imagine if we don't need to take from the ocean at all? Uh, look what's happening in aquacultured fish, clownfish, we don't need to get any more from the wild. 80% of all clownfish now, aquacultured. Uh, that yellow tang that I showed you, that's $600, they're breeding them now. They're breeding them and uh, they're selling them for $200. And it's the first time they've been bred really as a species over the last five, 10 years. And lastly, this knowledge and equipment transfer from the hobbyist to, uh, to the scientist we're teaching them how to grow corals in a box, which is elevate your, 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 your nitrates a little bit, keep your phosphates here. 
they use the same equipment, exactly the same equipment, exactly the same foods. And uh, here's a good example coming up right here. This is the Miami Intercoastal. Go ahead. They're cleaning this up. What we hope to do great is equipment. bring the natural habitat back. Right now, it's very difficult for even the fish to see, especially manatees. Hard for them to find food, and it's very hard for food to grow because photosynthesis, the sun is not reaching the bottom. This is Richard of Aficionado Channel and Reefs.com, and over here you'll see the barge that I have helped design. We're using aquarium technologies to polish the water of the local canal lakes. On the barge, as you can see here, we have a three large skimmers. They hold 300 gallons each. One that we're designing right now, they'll be holding 1,000 gallons. We have an apex system that's monitoring all different type of parameters, you know, like a pH, salinity, dissolved oxygen levels, temperature, and everything like that. And we're running everything from generators and, as well as some of solar panels. We have a weather apparatus that gives us rain data as well as wind, wind factors and humidity. We produce about 800 gallons of raw sewage, like extremely dry skim mate out of these uh, three skimmers that behind, that's behind you. The city contracts toxic waste management company and they come and they incinerate these because they cannot go back into the wild. They cannot go <laughs> leach back into the aquifer because of the so many different contaminants and other stuff that's found in there that's just very harmful for the nature. So uh, another quick story, when we went to the Reef Institute, we saw all hobby grade equipment, the same lights we use, the same skimmers we use. You guys were using two part do it yourself solution. Like this was a hobby led partnership, I guess, with the scientists and, and, and we have a great situation now where we can take care of corals in the water and out of the water. Um, and, and my message is basically, when I say in the water, I mean, I mean in the ocean or in a, in a nursery. Uh, what's the message here? Get involved, donate or, or, or volunteer and pick an initiative you like. Uh, there's a lot of organizations out there and, and we're helping uh, a few of them and uh, we're going to get more, more involved in these things. So what is Polo Reef doing about conservation? One, I want to do educational videos, teaching people how not to kill coral and fish. That's probably it's a good chunk of what we're doing. Um, we're trying to inspire the youth through philanthropy, scholarships. We're donating to marine science programs uh, in a few different states and a few different schools. We are um, developing uh, new approaches to fish and coral quarantine that work with different species and not with others. Uh, another interesting fact here, this is important. The majority of all the corals that we got from Polo Reef were internally sourced from the hobby from other fish tanks. We did not take from the wild. We bought tank breakdowns with massive colonies that people needed room. Uh, we're conducting scientific studies right now. We're doing one. Uh, someone gave us a cap phosphate disc to see whether the coral grows faster on that than a regular disc. Um, and we have uh, our own lighting parameter, uh, lighting programs that we test versus the, the uh, normal templates that come with the programs. And we also have... Uh, Apparel you can buy, and 100% of all uh, profits will generate with this. We'll go back into conservation efforts and marine science. And we're giving $10 gift certificates out for the store today for you guys. Um, they're up front, yeah. And we definitely want to mention the internship opportunity we're giving to a few FAO students in the uh, summer and spring 2023. And we'll be working with them. They'll be doing testing, coral care, and, and, and uh, they will leave my house with a tremendous knowledge. And that basically concludes it. Um, the summary is uh, not important.
Thank you very much. I, I would love to take questions. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. I think um, what you're doing gives a whole new meaning to the word hobby, I think. Um, we do have time for questions. I would ask you, if you have a question, raise your hand and I'll come over with the mic so the rest of the room can hear you. And I see one in the back. Give me a second to get back there. I will move quickly. I have two questions. The first one is, how are this there? What is the process when there's fish born in this, to the tank? We we see natural spawning every night by fish that everybody has not been able to breed. So we get to see things that other people don't. I mean. We come in every morning, the crosshatches are spawning. If I was able to get those babies, that's like a $5,000, $10,000 baby. The problem is uh, I can't get the scoop on time. The eggs get scattered. The other fish eat them. Uh, they go down to the drains fast. UV sterilizers, skimmers, bye-bye. So in order to do that, we would probably have to put egg collectors somewhere in the tank, maybe in this overflow work with a breeder somehow after that. But at the moment, um, nothing has been born in that tank. Okay, thank you. The, my second question is what inspired you to do this tank and start with the hobby? Uh, why'd I start this thing? I think I, think I may have been like, uh, an ADD hyperactive kid that needed some attention somewhere else kept me out of trouble. I don't know. I'm not sure. My grandfather took me. I was mesmerized. I was hooked. Uh, I started with fresh water and just never stopped. Okay, we got another one back here. Hey, Andrew. I uh, would certainly love a video of your tank to okay. show everybody. Oh, uh, you got, so any, you can, you got yeah, any eye candy yeah, there, Rashid? For sure. Uh, but Andrew, with all the contaminations that you deal with and keeping your fish healthy, how do you deal with your food supply that you're not uh, introducing contaminated uh, food, seaweed, etc.? And have you had a problem with that ever? I tried one new food recently and I got a little... I thought a parasite infestation after that, so I don't try that food anymore. But at the end of the day, um, it's pretty hard, I think, Dr. Greg. I mean, you, these, these foods are frozen, right? The, the, the crypto can't last through there, right? It, it, once it's frozen, it's over, right? So these, these things are fresh seafoods and they're deep freezed. Um, not, not, not on my concern list, really. Other questions? Sarah. Thank you for the talk. I was just curious, after you do all of the um, quarantining, both of the corals and of the fish, and you're treating them with all of these medications, what do you do with all of that water afterwards? Do you have any way of treating it? Do you reuse it? Does it just go down the drain? So we built uh, like six, six cesspools in the back of my um, house, and it, it guess it goes into there and seeps into the the sand. You mentioned uh, the nutrients, chemicals, etc. Uh, is ox how important is oxygen to coral? It, it's big, but it doesn't take to, to run a tank at full. Oxygen, which I think is, was it I want to say it's six ppm's or something like that, right? Six, seven ppm. Is that right, Dr. Greg? Am I good? So to get that number is not a difficult thing. So it's not something you got to have a lot of water movement and bubbles and all sorts of things. It's not a thing that that we worry about uh, once we have that water movement going. But what about the ocean? If if it's being the, depleted. The, the, the ocean you never have to worry about, right? I mean, uh, other than for oxygen and the dilution factor is unbelievable what's going on there. And the currents are unbelievable. 
Okay, we have one last question over here because we got a reception waiting for us, so. Yes, hi, Andrea, thank you for the presentation. Um, I had a question regarding more about the, uh, I guess, the planning and stuff like that. You said it took six years to build this tank, and I'm sure there's a lot of engineering. Uh, I was wondering who you kind of consulted to create this envision you had, because most hobbyists don't have anything to this scale, obviously. So I don't know if you consulted with zoos or aquariums, or how did you get your knowledge to build this? So in a different presentation that we gave a few weeks ago, we focus on the engineering of the tank and the computer system and all that stuff. And the, in the, this was a little more scientific, so we went this way. Um, however, yeah, soil sample tests, engineer flow tests, um, people that know pipes and how much they can flow through the pipes. And uh, you can't imagine how many people were contacted through this project. All right, if you had a question and you didn't get it answered, I'm very sure that Andrew and his team will be hanging around and be more than happy to have a chat with you and answer your questions. Um, please join us in the back. There's plenty of food, there's drinks, and please join me once more in thanking Andrew for his presentation. Thank you all, appreciate it, thank you.